Our text this evening is Psalm 32, 8 and 9. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bits and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. You will remember, beloved, at the beginning of this series, I made reference to the title of this psalm, a psalm of David, Maskeel. Remember that word maskeel means a poem or a song which teaches. And that word tells us what David's purpose in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is in writing this psalm. To teach transgressors God's way. Maskeel means teaching. That's David's purpose, of course, primarily his purpose is to glorify God as it is in all things. But he will glorify God, in particular in this psalm, by means of instruction. David, remember, is filled with thanksgiving to God because God has forgiven him his dreadful sins and restored him to a place of fellowship with his God. And now he desires to teach others Jehovah's way, so that they will experience the same blessedness and the same joy that he knows, and so that they will not have to experience the pain and misery which he went through when he strayed away from his God. Now he gets to the heart of his vow, which he made in Psalm 51, where he said that he would teach transgressors Jehovah's way. I will instruct thee, he says. I will teach thee. I will guide thee with mine eye. He will show in this psalm, as he has already shown, the danger and the folly of walking in the way of sin, and the joy which comes from being restored from that way through confession of sin and repentance from sin. He will use himself as an example, both as a warning of what one must not do, and an encouragement to those who fear perhaps that if they come to Jehovah God in repentance of heart, that God will not receive them. David says, God receive me in the way of repentance and faith, and God will also receive all those who come in that way. And the Lord will make this teaching effectual by applying it by his Holy Spirit to the lives of his people and for the salvation of sinners. Teaching is one of the purposes of the Psalms. And that's why, one of the reasons why, we sing Psalms in the public worship of God. The Psalms are filled with good instruction. They teach us about who God is. In fact, you can find all of the attributes of God taught in the Psalter. They teach us too about Jesus Christ. They prophesy his birth and his death. They speak of his resurrection and his ascension. They do so through the language of typology, of course, because Christ had not yet come. But they teach very plainly about Jesus Christ. Christ himself said all those things were written about him in the Psalms. And of course they do, because they are inspired by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, who gave unto the psalmist, David and the other psalmists, the words that they should write. And the Psalms teach us about sin. They warn us against sin. They teach us about godliness. They exhort us to walk in the paths of godliness. And for these reasons, the Psalms are superior to modern hymns. Hymns tend to be shallow. They don't teach you very much at all. They certainly don't teach you the great doctrines of the Christian faith as the Psalms do. Hymns are not the word of Christ, but Psalms are the word of Christ. 
And we are commanded that the word of Christ should dwell in us richly. And how does that happen? But through reading the word of God, and in particular, the Psalms. The Psalms breathe forth wisdom. And by these Psalms, we can and must and do admonish and teach one another. Because that's the way of God with his church. That sinners in the church, those who know what sin is, and who know more importantly what forgiveness of sin is, teach one another, and admonish one another, and hold one another accountable, and guide one another in the way in which they should go. Consider then, pardoned sinners teaching sinners. Pardoned sinners teaching sinners. Notice first the instruction, then the example, and finally the warning. David made a vow in Psalm 51 verse 13. He vowed to teach transgressors Jehovah's way. And now in our text, David explains how he intends to do this. David assumes the position of a teacher. I will instruct thee, he says. I will teach thee. I will guide thee. Now there's some difference of opinion among the commentators here about who exactly is speaking in our text. Who is the I in our text? I contend it is David himself. Some commentators say it's God. God is saying to David, as it were, in response to all that has gone before, David, I will instruct thee, I will teach thee, I will guide thee. But I argue for David from the psalm itself. Throughout the psalm, David has been the one saying, I. He said that I acknowledge my sin in verse 5. In verse 5 he says, I said I will confess my transgression. So it would be abrupt and rather strange for the I suddenly to become God. It's not impossible, of course, because often in the Psalms, things like that happen. The subject changes suddenly and without much warning. But I will say here that David is the one who is teaching. If you want to say that God is the one who is teaching, it really amounts to the same thing. Because God, if he is teaching, is using David as his instrument with which he will teach others in the church. God does not teach his people directly. He uses the word of God, and in particular, here, he uses other sinners in the church to teach the members of the church the way in which they should go. Because the thou and the thee, they are other members of the church. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Be ye not as the horse or the mule, and so on. They are the other members of the church. Members of Israel in the context of Psalm 32, and today members of the church of Jesus Christ. David here is going to give us practical instruction in practical godliness which flows out of sound doctrine. David understands, has come to understand by his own experience of sin and restoration who God is. That God is not the kind of God who tolerates sin in his children, but that God is also the kind of God who is merciful to those who come to him in the way of repentance. And he is going to teach, therefore, practical godliness which flows out of that knowledge. Warnings against ungodliness and exhortations of godliness. In verse 8, he uses three different words to indicate what he plans to do. He will instruct, he will teach, and he will guide. That verb instruct comes from the same root of maskil, and it means to cause to be prudent. 
And prudence is akin to wisdom, and wisdom is the right application of knowledge. To teach means literally to throw. And Hebrew is a language which uses a lot of pictures. And the idea here is of a father who is showing his son how to throw an arrow or a spear. And to guide means to counsel or to advise. That is to say, to give authoritative, practical advice and counsel in the way of God's commandments. He is going to tell us, he says in this psalm, he is going to teach us and instruct us in the way that we shall go. Notice that word, way. Way is a very important concept in the Bible. That word way is used over 100 times in the books of Psalms and Proverbs combined. A way is not a single step, but a way is the sum total of all of your steps. One step after another, after another, after another, put them all together and that is your way. So it is the general direction of a person's life either a way of godliness and obedience to God's commandments and walking with God in fellowship or a way of ungodliness and disobedience and walking away from God. And there only are two ways in the Bible. The way of the wicked, as Jesus describes it, is a broad way which leads to destruction. A way of wickedness, of disobedience and of sinful pleasure. And the way of the righteous, the way of the believer, is the narrow way, a difficult way, but a way of obedience to God and a way of walking in fellowship with God. It's a way of tribulation, a way of persecution, a way of struggle with your own sin and against the world and against the devil. But it leads to, by the grace of God, it leads to eternal life. And the members of the church, whether Old Testament Israel or New Testament Church of Jesus Christ, are called to walk according to the ways of Jehovah their God. God has set forth those ways for us in his word, so there can be no mistake about what those ways are. We belong, all of us, by nature, to the broad way which leads to destruction. And God has translated us from that way onto the narrow way which leads to eternal life. But the broad way is always very close by. And we are always being bombarded with temptations and allurements away from the narrow and the good way to rejoin the broad way. And the broad way always seems to be so much more attractive it seems easier. The wicked don't seem to have the problems that the Christian does. They seem to have a lot more pleasure in their life. And the wicked are often watching the Christian who is struggling along his narrow way and who are trying to enter the kingdom of God through much tribulation. And they say to the Christian, you fool, come to the broad way. The broad way is much better than the narrow way. Why would you want to walk upon the narrow way? Our way is much more fun. Come and join us. Come over to our side, to the broad way. At the same time, our flesh within us, our old man of sin, wants to go along the broad way. And David testifies in this psalm that he wandered off the narrow way onto the broad way. He wandered away from God. He walked in the way of disobedience. He walked in particular in the way of adultery and murder. And then in stubborn impenitence for almost a year. And now he is concerned that his fellow Israelites not walk in that way and not experience the misery that comes from walking in that way. And for those who are prone to stray, God provides 
teachers in the church, fellow believers who will be able to give good advice concerning the right way in which we ought to live. So our text tells us the importance of teaching in the church. Sorry, teaching so that we can live a life of practical godliness. Now David here is not promising to give us moral lessons on how to be a good person. This is walking in obedience to God in response to God's salvation of David. It's thankfulness that motivates David. He is concerned about the salvation and well-being of the people of God. God's people who are his chosen, redeemed people and those people who are his friends in the covenant of grace. And David has learned in a very particular way about the grace of God rooted in the cross of Jesus Christ. And he is compelled to tell others about the grace of God. To tell others that there is forgiveness for those who turn away from the way of sin. There is blessedness for those who repent and come back to Jehovah God. When they truly repent of their sin and are sorry for their sin, they will find that Jehovah God will be merciful to them and receive them. And that joy, which forgiven sinners experience, leads them to desire that that joy be shared by others. God has carried away the crushing burden of David's sin. God has covered up the pollution of David's sin. God has imputed the iniquity of David's sin elsewhere to the sin-bearing Messiah promised in the Old Testament and who came in Jesus Christ. God has not therefore imputed David's sin to himself. And God has taken away the guile out of David's mouth that the seat in which he lived for all those months and has caused him to be honest in his confession about his sin and now he has experienced the mercy of God. And we know in the New Testament that that is all because of Jesus Christ. Christ took away the burden of sin. Christ covered up our sin in his own blood. He took upon himself the full legal consequences of all of our iniquities. And now because of this experience that David has, he is qualified to be a teacher of God's people in practical godliness. And look at the transformation that has occurred in David's life by the grace of God. David had for a time refused to walk in the way in which he should have gone. Now he leads others in the right way. David had refused to listen to the Word of God. Now he exhorts others to listen to the Word of God. David had led others into sin. Think of Bathsheba. Now he warns others against sin, warns them not to stray off the road of God's commandments and plunge themselves into misery. And David is a testimony here to the fact that God is merciful. He does not cut sinners off. He could have done that to David. David richly deserved to be cut off. But rather, he uses David and David's experience of sin and grace as a benefit to the church of his day and the church of all ages. And the most teachable person and therefore the one most qualified to teach is the one who understands his own sin. He is humbled, deeply humbled by the sense of his own uncleanness in the sight of God, understands his own shortcomings and failures, and has come to know the blessedness of the forgiveness of sins in the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's greatly encouraging to us in the church today. God teaches sinners by other 
sinners. And David and I can come to his fellow Israelite and say to them, I know how enticing sin is. Sin enticed me. And I know that sin promises to give a great reward. But I can tell you from my own experience that sin lied. And that sin ends in misery. And don't therefore trifle with sin. He can say to you, I fell deeply into sin. So deeply, I thought I would never recover, but God forgive me. Turn from your sin, and God will also forgive you. You will know the blessedness that I know. And David can teach sinners something that not even the angels can teach them. Angels do not know sin. Angels have had no personal experience of sin. Angels have not been forgiven for their sins, and therefore angels cannot teach what David is here able to teach. And that is, in God's inscrutable wisdom, his way, his good way, his wise way, and his gracious way. And this all applies to all of us this evening. All of us who are sinners, saved by grace, and who now by grace walk in the way of thankful obedience, are qualified to teach one another in the church of Jesus Christ. Not all can be official teachers, not all can be elders or deacons or ministers, office bearers in the church, but all of us can and do and must teach. All office bearers in the church of the Old and New Testament are sinners. That's a fact. We're all sinners. And we're all called to teach other sinners the way in which they should go. Every true pastor understands that as he stands before God's people and shepherds God's people, he has this in his consciousness. He is a sinner, weak and prone to sin, just as the sheep he is called to shepherd are prone to fall into sin. That's why every faithful pastor must do his work prayerfully and must maintain close fellowship with Jesus Christ. The same is true of every elder and every deacon. They are called to oversee, they are called to serve in the church, Often they're called to work with members of the church who are disobedient. They all work in this consciousness that they are sinners. And this works in them humility before God. But for all that, God used sinners in the Old Testament and in the New to teach other sinners. Here's Exodus 18, verse 20, concerning the elders. Thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and thou shalt show them the way wherein they must walk. Malachi 2, 7 and 8 speak about the priest. The priest's lips keep knowledge. So you're supposed to go to the priest, and he's supposed to know things about God, he's supposed to teach you things about God. But he adds there that these priests have been unfaithful and it caused the people to turn out of the way in which they should go. But all of them, priests and elders and judges, all of them lived in the consciousness that they were sinners, that God is holy. The only way of salvation is through the blood that is offered on the cross. Blood in the Old Testament pointing to the coming Messiah who would die for the sins of of his people. And all of the godly kings of the Old Testament had this understanding as well. They taught the people. Asa did, Jehoshaphat did, Hezekiah and Josiah did, and now David does. And today we all have, as Christians who have the Spirit of Christ, all of us have the prophetic office. And we do, and we can, and we must teach one another. 
parents can come to their children in the way that David comes to the Israelites of his day and say, Son, daughter, I know how sin can be attractive to you. It's also attractive to me. But I also know by experience the bitterness of sin. And I know the sweetness of pardon. Here's the good way to walk, son or daughter. Walk in it. Let's walk in it together. And that instruction must always be by example. Let me show you, son or daughter. Let me show you the way in which you should walk. In fact, we should be able to say to our children, live like me. Walk in the way that I walk. We should not therefore be ashamed when we see that our children are walking as we walk because we should be walking in the way that we are commanded to walk in the Bible. When we see our own sins reflected in our own children, we know we are not giving them the example that we ought. And this is true for every member of the church of Jesus Christ. When you see a member of the church straying into sin, go to him or to her. Instruct him, teach him, guide him in the way that he shall go. Do it humbly, do it patiently, do it lovingly. And when such a member comes to you and says to you, brother or sister in the church, here's the way that you should go. Here's what the Bible says that you should do. You should not be doing this. You should not be doing that. We should then humbly listen to what that person says and submit ourselves to that instruction, understanding it comes from God because it's based upon God's Word. David gives us the example of how we are to teach one another in the church, how parents are to teach their children how ministers and elders are to teach the members of the church, and how the individual member is to exhort the other member in the church. I will guide thee, he says, with my eye. Literally, he says, I will guide thee with my eye upon thee. And here we have a beautiful figure again. David is guiding with careful watchfulness and loving attention. One does not guide with one's eye upon someone by standing aloof and shouting instructions from the sidelines. One does not guide with one's eye upon someone by being coldly indifferent to the other members of the church with the attitude of Cain. Am I my brother's keeper? One does not guide with one's eye upon someone by being arrogant and contemptuous, looking down one's spiritual nose at the other members of the church, as the Pharisees and the scribes did. Rather, the figure here is of a father teaching his young son to ride a horse, or to make it a more modern example, to ride a bicycle. And the young son is struggling with the pedals, and he's wobbling dangerously as he tries to ride this bike, and the father is watching carefully for that moment where it seems like the son might fall off the bike, and as soon as he sees that, he stretches forth his hand to steady that young boy's bicycle. And the son then can ride with confidence, knowing he is under the careful, watchful eye of his father. In this way, David says to the, his fellow Israelite, I will guide thee with my eye. In a careful manner, David and we too are called to instruct and admonish one another with compassion seeking always one another's good. When we see a fellow member erring or steering off course, we come alongside him to steady him, to encourage him, to exhort him, to admonish, and even sometimes to rebuke him. We do this always with his welfare, 
at heart. Our attitude must be one of compassion and heartfelt humility. We are all sinners. We're helping one another as sinners, all of us going toward the heavenly fatherland. We're all filled with joy and gratitude because we have been forgiven our sins. And we are willing, therefore, and able to point such erring members to the cross of Jesus Christ to find mercy in the same place where we find mercy. And that's our calling as members of the church. Pastors and elders are to keep their eye upon the congregation. Parents are to keep their eye upon their children. Husbands and wives are to keep their eye upon their spouse. Children and young people are to keep their eye upon one another and especially upon their own brothers and sisters in the home. In that way, we guide one another. We look out for the welfare of one another. And we do this by leading by example. We don't just tell them what they should do, we show them how they should do it. And David, for a time, did not lead by example. His actions were a scandal to the rest of the people of God. But God still uses David as an object lesson in his mercy. Says David, look at my life, you will see the deceitfulness of sin. It's not a game. It's not entertainment. It's not something you should trifle with. There's no joy in sin. There's only misery in sin. Read what I said about sin earlier in this chapter. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Look at my life, says David. If the devil could topple David, a man of God, a man after God's own heart, the sweet psalmist of Israel, then be warned. The devil could also topple us. We must watch and pray. David did not watch and pray, and so he fell. But look at my life in the third place, says David, and be encouraged. If God could forgive David for his dreadful sin of adultery and murder, one who had such a privileged life, one to whom God had given so much, and yet he turns around and in gross ingratitude, sins against God in this manner. If God can forgive him, then surely God can forgive us when we come to him. And there's a warning too, says David, if God's heavy hand came upon me and God did not spare me, then beware because God will not spare you if you sin in the way that I sin. There were consequences, painful chastisements which came upon David and they were necessary too. Otherwise, David would have been emboldened to sin. And his example, if he had had no consequences, would have meant that people would have said, well, David did it, and he got away with it, so why won't I get away with it? And so David continues to teach us today. He has been teaching the church for thousands of years, ever since he penned this psalm, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he has taught the church the deceitfulness of sin, the terrible consequences of sin, and the great mercy of God to those who come and confess their sin to him. And that's the gospel in this psalm. As Paul quotes this psalm in Romans 4 verse 6, even as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness without works. The gospel of justification by faith alone without works, leading to a life of thankfulness is taught by this son. But to drive the point home, 
David gives us a negative example which we must not follow. Be ye not as the horse or the mule, verse 9 tells us. A believer must not behave like a horse or a mule and respond to instruction, admonition, or rebuke in that way. And here David confesses his own foolishness, his stupidity, his brutishness. David says, be ye not as a horse or as a mule, and the implication he means, I was like a horse and a mule. Horses and mules are not naturally tame animals. We might think they are because we've probably never seen a wild horse. But horses and mules have to be tamed, otherwise they are of no use to man. The stubbornness of mules is proverbial. You can pull a mule. In this way or that way, he will dig in his hoofs and he will not budge. And horses are not much better. They're shy, timid, nervous creatures. And they must be tamed before they can be used by man. But a well-trained mule is an excellent beast of burden. And a well-trained horse is a courageous steed in battle. And because horses and mules have no understanding and are difficult to control, they require the bit and the bridle, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. The bridle is the headgear you put upon a horse, which controls and directs and steers that animal in the way that it should go. And the bit is the part you put inside its mouth. And together, these parts, and also a whip, and maybe some reins and so on, they will help you to steer a horse. Without them, the horse will do its own thing. You will try to ride a horse, it will stop and start eating things at the side of the road. It will not go the way that you want it to go. Horses are like that. They need bits and bridles. And why? Because they have no understanding. Understanding is insight. Horses and mules are animals, and therefore they do not have the faculty of reason. You can't argue with a horse or a mule. You can't discuss with a horse or a mule. You can call them, and they might begin to recognize your voice, the tone of your voice, but they won't understand the words that you're saying. You can train them with sugar lumps, rewards, and punishments, they understand that kind of language, perhaps. You can discipline them with a bit and a bridle, but you cannot say to a horse, horse, let me explain to you the way in which you should go. You should go in this direction and not in that direction. Let me reason with you, horse, about what you should do. No, you can't do that with a horse or with a mule because they have no understanding. But man has understanding, or at least he should have understanding. He has reason, he is a rational moral creature, unlike a horse. Horses cannot bear the image of God. Men can. Horses have no understanding. Horses cannot reason. Men can. Horses are irrational, brute beasts. And it's a terrible thing when a child of God is described as a horse or a mule. It becomes like an irrational brute beast. Behaves as if he or she has no understanding. But that's what David did. David knew what the law of God said, but David refused to walk in the way of God's commandments. He lost, as it were, his spiritual senses. He began to act in a way in which he knew was wrong. His lusts 
carried him away into foolishness. And nothing anyone could do or say to him would make any difference to him because he was carried away by what he wanted to do and he became like an untrained horse, a brute beast. Well, we can do that too. We can become stiff-necked and spiritually stupid, like a horse or like a mule. And all admonitions then will fall on deaf ears. And then there's only one remedy left, the bit and the bridle. Here's what Proverbs 26 verse 3 says. A whip with a horse, a bridle for the ass, and a rod for the fool's back. And that's the implicit warning in our text. For the backsliding Christian who will not hear, who will not be taught, there are consequences. There's the bit and there's the bridle. If we will not hear by the ordinary preaching of the word, the admonition of our parents, the admonition of fellow believers in the church. If we will not be taught, if we show ourselves to be unteachable like a horse or a mule, God will use the bit and the bridle upon us. And David has already testified <coughs> concerning what this bit and bridle are like in verses in verse 3 and 4. The heavy hand of God upon him, his roaring in anguish, his broken bones, his dried up spirit. All of these were God applying the bit and the bridle. And they make life unpleasant. And really, they should never have to be used on us. A bit and a bridle are for foolish, stubborn beasts. And for foolish, stubborn Christians. And the bit and the bridle are those providences, those painful providences, which God uses to restrain and steer us in the way in which we should go when we will not listen to his admonition in his word. He may take away from us things which we hold dear to get our attention because we are so spiritually stupid we will not listen to him in any other way. Perhaps he sends affliction upon us to bring us to our needs. And God will do whatever it takes because he will not allow his people to walk impenitently in sin and behave themselves like stubborn mules and foolish horses. So if we refuse to hear the word of God, we will be treated as a horse or as a mule which does not have understanding. Do not be surprised then, beloved, if God takes out his whip and his bit and his bridle and causes you to submit to him, if you will not listen to what you should do from the word of God. But even with the whip and the bit and the bridle, which God uses with foolish and stubborn and wayward Christians, God's grace is clearly to be seen. God applies these instruments of correction, the bit and the bridle, because he loves us and will not permit us to perish. He does not apply these things ordinarily to unbelievers. He usually lets them go off on their merry way and then they perish. And if he does not use these things on us, then there is that possibility humanly speaking, that we will wander away from him, far away from him, and perish forever. But that is not God's will for his people. He will use the bit and the bridle to preserve us from perishing in our sin. If he does not use the bit and the bridle, we will not approach unto him. It's painful, but it's better than being left their own devices. But better by far to listen to the word of God 
to listen to the admonitions of the fellow members of the church and to, and to obey God before he takes out his bit and his bridle. But none of these bits or bridles, as painful as they may be to the wayward and foolish and stubborn Christian, none of them atone for sin. None of them purchase salvation for us. All of the stripes fell on Christ on the cross. He was beaten with God's heaviest rods. And we have been spared from that. Let us then learn from this example of David. Stay on the good path. And should we stray, listen to admonitions from fellow sinners. And be quick to repent and find the grace of God. Lest God take out his bit and bridle. And treat us as foolish and stubborn beasts. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we confess that by nature and often in practice we are foolish beasts before thee. We pray that thou mayest give unto us daily repentance from our sins. We may not stray far away from thee and come under thy severe chastisement. We pray that thou wilt keep us. Keep us by all the means which thou hast at thy disposal, because we know that our salvation is, humanly speaking, impossible. But with thee, all things are possible, for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen.